I'm extremely grateful for this uh, award. I stress here that through my career, ECS has been my professional home, and I don't see any alternative to it in doing two things. Now, uh, one is to cover the complete spectrum of science, engineering, and fabrication uh, in the field of electrochemistry, and the other one providing an inviting arena for both academy, national laboratories, and industry. And this explains <coughs> the fact that this is my professional home, uh, explains very much the great significance of this award for me. However, let me stress something, and that is if you look at the awardees uh, of the Pauline Palladium Medal in the past, I think I'm the first who's, get, who's getting the award for contributions uh, where the major component is polymer electrolyte fuel cell. I've done work in other fields, but this is by far the uh, strongest contribution that I've made. So I really feel that this award goes to the field. And I mean it very seriously. I think that uh, this field has advanced tremendously well, all the way from the lab to hundreds of fuel cell electric vehicles, thanks to the teams, research development and engineering teams that have devoted uh, extremely nice and strong efforts to this uh, work. I mean here primarily teams from industrial labs as in the automotive industry and uh, uh, fuel cell industry, national laboratories. These two probably have been the most important, although not by any means exclusive uh, contributors. And so I feel actually fortunate to have been chosen to accept this award as representative of these excellent teams. And it's a great honor indeed. Now, the outline of my talk will be along three subjects. One is uh, the vision and uh, the technical team and the first critical steps made at the Electronic Engineering Division at Los Alamos National Laboratory in 1984, or a few years, actually started a few years before that. Then, platinum loading, 1984 to 2019, and then recent developments in the R&D of polymer electrode fuel cells during the last 12 years, and there the stress will be on hydroxyl exchange, mem exchange membrane fuel cells and direct ammonia fuel cells. So here's the status that I uh, found out about in the 1980 when I came to uh, Los Alamos and looked around what was going on there. I came originally on sabbatical for the University of Tel Aviv and I worked there for several years on a temporary assignment, so to speak, until I decided to stay. Uh, so following the invention of the PFC at General Electric in Schenectady, New York, which happens to be the place where I live right now. <laughs> so uh, the development of hydrogen oxygen uh, PFC stacks for space applications was pursued in the 1970s by GE in a place called Lynn, Massachusetts. And I was uh, fortunate to uh, go there once and uh, visited the place. And this was the place where I actually, for the first time, understood something really uh, basic and fundamental about polymer electrolyte fuel cells. And the teacher there was uh, Laconti, Tony Laconti, from, uh, later on from Wiener. Okay? He was not a classical electrochemist, material scientist, I think rather but he understood a lot about the membrane and as a result of that also about the cell. Uh, and then in the early to mid 1980 at Los Alamos in the 
Electronics Engineering Division, the hydrogen air fuel cell, polymer electrolyte fuel cell rather, was recognized as potential power source for transportation applications by the following attributes. That it is a low temperature pseudo solid state. Okay, you have to add the water, but you can think about it as kind of semi solid state device. No liquid electrolyte, and it operates uh, at temperatures under 100 degrees C, has a potential for high energy and high power density and high efficiency, and has a potential for zero tailpipe emission. All that sounds now very familiar. And it sounds now like it's the most natural thing in the world to decide that polymer electrolyte fuel cell should be power sources for transport applications. However, during this time, first of all, pay attention to the fact that the vision was not by us electrochemists. The vision was coming from the EE division. Uh, and uh, they, they saw uh, some of the visionaries there. Uh, those of you who were at the Fusion Symposium in Dallas have met uh, Byron McCormick. Uh, he was one of them, and they simply saw exactly what is written here as a justification for making the effort. Uh, so, frankly, uh, during that first few years, the feedback from established electrochemical research group, electrochemistry research groups in the United States, the feedback was loud and negative. Uh, they did not like the idea at all, and they had several reasons. One had to do with the very high loading of platinum that was used for space applications, which they claim will not be possible to correct, number one. Number two, very complex water management in the membrane. Number three, the very high sensitivity of platinum to trace of carbon monoxide at such low temperature. So altogether, the feedback was, as I said, vocal and negative. Industry, they were not interested at all at the time, the automotive industry, in anything to do with alternative fuels and or with platinum rich technologies. So altogether, this was almost a vision faced significant uh, pushback. Uh, and uh, the people who ran this uh, uh, mission really had a significant challenge to cross the first important barriers and to get the first funding for it. Uh, why was that group interested in doing that and capable of doing that. So they decided at the electronics division that one group called MEE11 uh, to do with, uh, again, it's, it's a part of the electronics engineering division. It was chosen as home for the new program on PEFC for transport. And I believe that the interdisciplinary make of this group may have played an important role in the success of the PEFC for transport project at Los Alamos. And I'll show you in some detail, uh, very briefly, what I mean. When I came to Los Alamos, it's down there in the right uh, bottom, uh, I was uh, not classified as fuel cell because I was a university professor. And fuel cells are something too applied and too, you know, uh, uh, engineering, uh, uh, you know, subject. So because my background was in uh, Department of Chemistry and characterization of interfaces and all that, I was placed in the group in uh, that um, uh, part of the group called characterization of materials and circuits. And the three people with whom I had most intimate interaction at the time were first and foremost uh, the group leader, 
Ross Lemons, Applied Physics PhD, Carl Majori, Particle Beam, Study of Materials, PhD Physics, Tony Redondo, PhD Applied Physics Theory. Okay, so it was a group of applied physicists, not electrochemists. The only one who had an electrochemistry background was Mark Buffett, uh, who was kind of a native of the area. And uh, however, he uh, at the time preferred very much to work on UHV uh, interfaces, I mean, uh, solid gas interfaces. And he cooperated with uh, this person here, who you may recognize some of you. This is Charlie Campbell, who has been for years now professor of surface science at Washington uh, State University of Washington. And my interaction during the first period of my stay there was with these people. Okay, only later, okay. Only later, I uh, got a stamp of a fuel cell party, okay? Uh, let me explain to you something about uh, what was required at the time in order to survive this uh, struggle to uh, advance the uh, study of uh, polymer electrolyte fuel cells in spite of the pushback. What was required was exemplified by Ross. Ross Lemons was asked all the time by people who came to visit us, why are you doing that? That's a terribly uh, daunting uh, subject. All of these difficulties with, you know, nobody understands really what's going on at this uh, point of the three phase contact there between the membrane and the solid catalyst and gas maybe only 1% of the area is going to be active. It's, a, it, it, it's so complicated and why are you doing that? And for transport application, Ross's uh, answer always was, this is what the national laboratory is for. In other words, as long as industry feel that it's very daunting, and at the same time, there is a good reason to believe that if the technology were to succeed, it would make a very uh, significant dent in clean and green and efficient transportation, then it's the task of the National Laboratory to uh, address the challenges, okay? And I think that what is required for there is some sort of uh, balance uh, characteristics, uh, personal attribute, uh, attributes, that I believe that I learned from him first and foremost. And the result of this learning is what uh, Mark Matthias described in the ECS uh, uh, meeting as a volcano curve for uh, technology creation rate versus the uh, uh, energy of optimism minus energy of realism, okay? And where he placed me there, I, I feel is a great compliment, okay? And this is exactly how I would describe Ross's attitude at the time. In other words, you have to be a little bit uh, of, uh, you know, uh, willing to play out of the box to some degree. Mark called it uh, fanciful, I would say bold, okay? And on the other side, he called, he called it cynical. You may call it conservative, okay? But this balance is a very important key, and I learned it from uh, Ross Lemons. Later on, I became uh, engaged with people who you must have heard much more about than the previous group. And uh, Srini, who appears here on the left side, was uh, my first introducer to fuel cells uh, when he headed the group at Brookhaven. Ian came with, uh, uh, after a postdoc at Stanford on uh, solid state electrochemistry. And Tom Springer was really uh, 
a key for the whole project in that he was uh, a very experienced modeler of complex systems. And you remember perhaps his name as first author in many of our uh, publications. So by then I was already uh, electrochemistry in fuel cells uh, member. Okay, 15 years later, the group looked roughly like that. Some people are missing here, but now you, I'm sure, recognize quite a few of the players. So this was the team that I was fortunate to uh, help assemble at Los Alamos before. Uh, uh, people with a, ast with a uh, star over, over their head from left to right are Tom Zabodzinski, Tom Springer, Malin Wilson, and uh, Piotr Zelenay who is here in the audience. So this, by the way, was uh, for an article in the C and uh, C uh, Chemical and Engineering News, and it describes the uh, work of the group. So I'm stressing the item team all the time because it was not my work. It was a teamwork all along. Uh, let's start now with uh, some technical uh, results. Uh, early on, the first discovery was made by Ian Restrick at the time. And what he did was to take a uh, electrode of a phosphoric acid fuel cell and wetted it with uh, recast natrium and showed that after that was done he could uh, show the same activity ORR with 0.4 milligram per centimeter squared compared with what was achieved with a Teflon bonded or PTFE bonded electrodes in space applications uh, at 10 milligram platinum per centimeter squared. So just allowing the access of the ions as we all understand now to the catalyst was an important key. However, uh, at the time there was still no understanding about uh, where, where, where the reaction will take place. And is it uh, really the best way that you can do is to cover all these catalysts with ionomer and you know, and that's what I was hoping to bring up, is that we're looking today in 2019 very much at this question, how is the best way to mix the catalyst with the ionomer? And we tried first to answer that in a paper in 1987. I don't think it's one of the most quoted uh, papers that we have from Los Alamos, but it was the first that looked at the problem or uh, the question, which is the height of interest. You should count here in this uh, meeting uh, a number of papers devoted to what is the optimized way to mix the catalyst with the ionomer. And we really asked this question, is, uh, is there uh, this uh, three phase uh, meeting point, which is the only active uh, uh, site, or is it possible that the gas has sufficiently high permeability in order to cross the film and interact with the film uh, catalyst interface. And the first results there would uh, remind you of some of the reports uh, given today. This is an RDE experiment. And you can see here uh, the uh, need of activation of the surface after you apply the ionomer to the surface. You need to scan the potential back and forth and I'm sure that this oxidation reduction of the surface has a very important head, a very important effect. Granted, in this particular case, because it's RDE, electrolyte outside was dilute sulfuric acid. So what uh, got in, in contact with the uh, uh, surface uh, was uh, dilute sulfuric acid, I believe, okay? But in any case, there is no question that as you apply the ionomer to the catalyst, this is not a very active interface before you give it some jolt. 
And the next thing was that we measured the diffusion coefficient and concentration in the film by combining two measurements. One was steady state, and the other one was linear scan. And you remember that in the steady state measurement, the current is proportional to d times c, first order each one. And in any case of the scan, it's d times c to the power one half. And therefore, when you measure these two things, both the uh, DC, so what, what you see here is, of course, the uh, uh, current potential curve, a steady state uh, with the RD as function of rotational uh, speed. And uh, you see the results for the bare RDE and for the filmed RDE. And from this uh, retardation of the limiting current by the film, you can uh, figure out the permeability together with the other measurement here. And so we got some numbers here. You can see the ballpark for the recast film is uh, four times 10 minus six for the concentration in mole per cubic centimeter, 1.5 times 10 to the six for the diffusion coefficient uh, in this uh, recast film. And uh, then, came the days of the ink. In other words, there was, of course, the previous result is for a model system. You just put the film on a flat surface. This is perhaps the most important breakthrough at the time. Uh, credit belongs to a very large degree to Malon Wilson. And he showed how to prepare an ink that can be applied to the membrane. He brought some know-how with him, by the way, from a group that did heter heterogeneous catalysis, and they prepared inks. And they knew that uh, a solvent of high viscosity like uh, glycerol can, maintain, can uh, sustain high degree of dispersion uh, for a longer period of time. And so this use of glycerol really was important also in, in this uh, formation of the ink. So the ink really opened the door for preparation of some real uh, cells that uh, could be tested and evaluated and uh, uh, studied. Here is an, an interesting uh, number. At that point, 1993, our paper in the Journal of Electrochemical Society reported already 0.15 milligram platinum per centimeter squared. In other words, the drop in loading all the way down to almost where we are today, but I'm cheating, <laughs> was uh, 0.15 milligram per centimeter squared because the performance is still not terribly high and beyond everything else, the pressures used here for the air particularly are unrealistic. It is still not state of the art in 2019 by any stretch of the imagination, but it already uh, resulted in uh, 0.3 gram platinum per kilowatt at the time. Now, it still was still too high for various reasons. Uh, and uh, the ultimate uh, target of 0.07 milligram per kilowatt uh, for today, as understood today, uh, requires in turn minimized losses at the current of two amps per centimeter squared, 0.65 volt by cathode using ultra low platinum loading. And so just to remind you, when we did the very detailed first uh, paper on diagnostics, the limiting current that appeared could all be beautifully explained by transport limitation in the G in the gas diffusion medium, all you know obeying Stefan Maxwell equations, and so there was no surprising limiting current there as yet. Now, of course, during the years, there was a lot of microscopy going on, and also uh, this is work of uh, Karen Moore and Rod Barb, and. Uh, there was also an understanding that uh, the components of the catalyst layer are not exactly uniformly 
uh, distributed. But the general understanding was that we have a, a handle on the uh, system because these macro homogeneous approaches yielded very reasonable results. And then came 2009, and here's this paper that I think was first uh, published uh, in 2009 from uh, General Motors. And uh, they said, hey, there is another type of performance limitation identified in cathodes using ultra low loadings. And uh, you may recognize by now this uh, 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 mass transport resistance called R sub O2, which is localized around the catalyst. And uh, you may be familiar, of course, with the presentations of uh, the challenge of not covering the catalyst layer too much by this ionomer. In other words, letting the catalyst somehow uh, be uh, fed, so to speak, by the ionomer in some ways, but not completely cover. And so the uh, conclusion uh, recently, as you can see here, 2018, was that uh, perhaps, not perhaps, but it's a demonstration that mesopause and high surface area carbons provide, I, I, I call it, provide an asylum for the, for the uh, catalyst particles such that it is not completely covered by the ionomer. The ionomer only accesses the catalyst particles through uh, pores, pores in, the, in the carbon. And when I saw that, I said to myself, hey, let's go back to these numbers that we uh, retrieved in 1987 for the fundamental properties of transport of oxygen in these ionomeric film. Let's see what we can get from that and how it compares with the claim that there's a big problem if the catalyst particle is fully covered by the, uh, I'm sorry, by the uh, ionomer. And so, it's just a reminder, a reminder that all these uh, possible combinations of uh, platinum in the pore and platinum outside covered by the catalyst, by the uh, ionomer, uh, well, this was described in a paper 2014 from Yamanashi. And then came most recently uh, also papers that said, hey, the story is not straightforward because in some of the cases, if you improve the wetting of the surface such that the ionomer can spread better, that's good for you in some cases. It's not, it's not uh, killing the performance. It's rather, rather increasing <laughs> or, or increasing the utilization of the platinum. In other words, even particles like this here that's covered could be active. And it was interesting. And so I'm, I did a quick uh, back of the envelope. I believe that in general, back of the envelope is one of the most effective tools in uh, research. <laughs> and uh, this back of the envelope said the following. Let's assume an assembly of supported catalyst agglomerates of uniform radius R and there is an ionomer volume fraction in the solid mass of uh, 60%. This is typical for uh, inks that uh, are being used. And then uh, all the ionomer is in the form of a shell around our agglomerate. When will that happen? Probably when the, so to speak, shake and bake uh, uh, manipulation is perfect and, and you end up with the perfect coating of every agglomerate particle by, by, by the uh, ionomer. So when you look at what, the, what that means and you say, okay, what is then the condition for a catalyst particle covered by an ionomer film being active, you can define what is the demand flux of the oxygen through 
a uh, shell of ionomer around the agglomerate. And it has to, of course, uh, correspond or exceed the rate of current generation inside this particle. Okay, so what happens when the particle size changes? When the radius decreases, it has a two, uh, two components uh, effect, both going in the same direction. The total rate of current generation within a smaller particle is smaller. So you have to, to supply less oxygen into the particle. At the same time, if you demand that all the uh, ionomer is in the form of these shells, the shell for the smaller particle is thinner. Okay, and so the net result is the following, that if you have an agglomerate radius of one micrometer, then the demand uh, product of D times C is six to the six times 10 minus 11 moles centimeters, moles centimeter per second. But if it's 0.1 micron, the demand is much more modest. And so your chance of uh, answering this demand by the transport properties of the ionomer shell, your chances to fulfill that are much better. Okay, you can see that drop in uh, R by factor 10 uh, lowers the demand flux by factor 100. Now, when we go back to the numbers that we cranked out in 1987, the result was a product of 9 times 10 to the minus 12. So you can see that the one micron agglomerate radii demand more than can be supplied from these values of D and C that are measured for an ionomer film imbibed in water. Whereas for 0.1 micrometer, you may have a chance to uh, provide the flux required. Very simple result, very, uh, I would say, uh, shall I say, I'm surprised that I haven't heard about, about this before, but here's the test. So, quoting from the group from Technical University of Munich, Quote, for the ionomer solvent composition mimicking the ink used for the catalyst layer with the best hydrogen air performance, very small ionomer aggregates with a single peak at seven nanometers are observed. So small particle sizes, small agglomerate sizes, allow the higher performance. Large hydrodynamic diameters correspond to poor hydrogen air performance. How did they come to that conclusion? That was shown in the uh, Dallas meeting. And uh, here it is. So they had dynamic light scattering analysis. And you see the, what, what makes the difference here is the solvent. When you go from one propanol to two propanol, completely different situation for one reason or another. But the net result is that when you work with one propanol, uh, you have this peak, which does not appear here. And uh, lo and behold, this is the ink that gives the highest performance, lowest, uh, I mean the highest limiting current. So the small particle size lifts this limiting current, okay? So I would suggest, uh, based on this back of the envelope calculation, that, that uh, a catalyst layer based on mesoporous carbon support and small aggregate dimensions could secure high utilization of platinum catalyst particles both inside accessible pores and on the outer surface of the agglomerate. Okay, I believe I have to consider uh, the total time allocated. So let me, 
let me come to the final chapters of my work uh, in recent years. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, the director of these programs at RPAE sitting in the audience. Uh, and I mean it, that it's a pleasure. Uh, one project has to do with the hydroxide exchange membrane fuel cell. And you know, of course, that if you want to tie all of these efforts of ultra low platinum loading issues with the HEMFC, the HEMFC, let me actually return to this. Yes. In the HEMFC, non PGM catalysts to replace the ultra low platinum loadings required for the PEMFC cathode. And because of that, cost-wise acceptable catalyst loadings are of the order of one milligram per centimeter squared. And then you remove all these issues with localized mass transport. So if you were able to uh, transit, transit to the HMFC and use in the cathode stuff like silver catalysts of a much higher loading, then this problem that is being covered for example, in this meeting by so many papers, will be lifted. However, of course, justifiably, you all come back to me and say, well, all right, if you solve this problem, don't you buy yourself another set of problems which are associated with the MFC or challenges associated with the MFC, which are stable membrane availability, lower power density, complex water management, and the activation by air CO2. And so the project that I'm involved with right now at the University of Delaware, together with the chair and uh, a bright young man by the name of Brian Setzler, has to do with trying to solve the CO2 issue. And uh, to jump immediately to the results, first of all, state-of-the-art HMFC with ultra-low platinum loadings this time all in the anode rather than in the cathode, and because of that also suffering less of a penalty because of mass transport limitations, because hydrogen is neat and oxygen is diluted times five in air, and because of that there is less expected fall of the current uh, due, to, due to localized mass transport uh, limitation in the in the anode when you use low platinum loadings and indeed you can see that it goes all the way to very high current densities uh, let's leave that aside uh, as far as water management is concerned that's one target that has to be understood and here I just want to share with you the very nice time that uh, <laughs> that we had at PSI. For your information, PSI are uh, the winners of uh, uh, the host of uh, the research. We came there and the red carpet that we received there in the form of the best uh, work uh, done uh, was wonderful and this was my first experience with a neutron imaging of the water in the cell. Uh, the person on the left is sitting here by the way. <laughs> and so uh, so this was the first AMFC facing a neutron beam and uh, the, the result quickly can be seen here all the anode channels are horizontal. The cathode channels are vertical. You don't see any uh, water in, in anything vertical. All the water is on the anode side. And here, the trick that we tried was to leave the uh, anode dead-ended such that there will be a buildup of water which would suffice for effective transport of water through the membrane to the cathode, which is a very important key to achieve high performance. The one other thing that I want to uh, 
call your attention to is that here it's dry. And this is where the air comes in on the upper right. And so in spite of the fact that the air here is going through a water exchanger, has an RH on entry, therefore, of about 80%. It's enough to dry out this corner. So this flow field has to be changed. It all has to do with the fact that all the air enters there at one point, and therefore the flow rate is very high to satisfy this uh, 240 centimeters squared. But it shows the problems of water management in a larger sieve. So that was one effort to do with the water management. The other recently has to do with the CO2 tolerance. And here are quick curves to remind everybody that CO2 really kills the performance of uh, HEMFC. So what can you do about it? So there have been several efforts to, to say we can scavenge the CO2, we can catch the CO2 out of the air before the air enters, enters the HEMFC. They were all okay, but too, uh, too bulky and also expensive. And so most recently, I've been fortunate to work at New Dell together with uh, Yushan, the chair here, and uh, Brian Setzler on a novel approach, which says you can use uh, an electrochemical pump of CO2 in front of the cathode inlet, and you can remove the CO2 in that way. I feel uh, off the hook with explanation of details because Brian Setzer gave here a detailed talk about it before. So here's the last thing that I want to talk about and that's direct ammonia. So why direct ammonia? The rationale is we're uh, looking at the infrastructure challenge in the case of the hydrogen fuel and maybe the resolution of that is to uh, replace uh, gaseous hydrogen compressed to 700 bars by a fuel that is liquid form near temperature, near room temperature and under reasonable pressures, low pressures, and ammonia fulfills that. And so that was the rationale for a program called Refuel uh, run by ARPA-E. And uh, Again, if you ask, uh, why do you want to do something which is so difficult? Because the ammonia oxidation reaction is not the most friendly uh, process that you can think about, okay? And so because of that and other uh, issues to do with crossover of ammonia, it's not a simple system to try to resolve. But the answer is exactly what Ross Lemon said to me many years ago and to us when a uh, project or, or a target is very challenging and it's worth the effort. That's what you need to be involved with, okay? So uh, this is the latest result that we managed to achieve in the direct ammonia fuel cell. And that's really uh, much higher than I was uh, frankly hoping that, that we could achieve at this point, although it's still not enough, okay? It's, uh, you can see that the open circuit voltage is still low, meaning that there is some crossover uh, problem remaining there. And uh, there are other uh, issues here, but it's a very significant advancement to all people here involved in electrocatalyst development, the best catalyst that was reported in 1969 for the ammonia oxidation reaction is iridium. We all know that iridium is not very good news in terms of the dollar sign, okay, attached to it. We have not found a significantly better catalyst during this period of uh, work. So, challenge. Anybody here who thinks that they have a way to uh, replace iridium for ammonia oxidation reaction, I'd be very glad to talk to. 
And so if we are able eventually to sustain uh, that uh, power output for a significant period of time, then you can think about the Mirai carrying liquid ammonia instead of carrying compressed hydrogen. And you'd see immediately a significant uh, uh, drop in the volume of the gas tank required because you're looking now at liquid fuel instead of gaseous fuel. And uh, yes, the stack is going to be larger, but the trade-off could be acceptable, provided we continue to, to um, succe succeed in, in, uh, in this project. End of my talk. Many thanks are due to all my colleagues for the privilege of their collaboration over the years particularly at these three points, Los Alamos, Celera, Pio Celtic in Israel, and recently the University of Delaware. Uh, I'd like to recognize the many years support from US DOE hydrogen and fuel program, and the support of our recent project at the University of Delaware by US DOE ARPA-E. This is the uh, GM vehicle uh, with fuel cell under the hood, which uh, was given to this test driver in 2009 to test in uh, upstate New York. And I still remember that Mark Matthias told me, it's okay here, it's in the middle of nowhere. If you want to press on it, press. And I pressed and I reached 110 miles per hour without any problem. And I, I was very impressed by it. <laughs> By that, of course, okay. Uh, you, you probably cannot uh, identify me. I'm the driver here. And the guy next to me is Danny Baker, who is really a wonderful scientist. And he, he is the first author on that 2009 paper, which describes the local mass transport limitations. So you see here two people who think all the time about the nano and micro scale driving the car and you know the tie is very strong and this seems to be the future for us and uh, i don't know whether you had an opportunity to interact with uh, some of the guys from this uh, company during the meeting uh, i think that the uh, identification of uh, larger vehicles as a target for fuel cell at this point uh, has happened and here's a company that is willing to do something that uh, my good friend uh, Grigori uh, several years ago when we had this discussion on the way to the Golden Conference asked me who can make money out of hydrogen fueling station they seem to be able to resolve the question okay uh, and, and, and that they have a package where they lease the car and part of the lease probably has to do also use of hydrogen from fueling stations that this company is scheduled to put together. So that's very encouraging. Thank you all for the appreciation and for the attention.